So the focus of this talk is the ground state eigenvalue problem, where we want to find the lowest eigenvalue of an operator uh, on a Hilbert space, which you can think of as a, a function space consisting of functions of many uh, variables, uh, enough so that cursive dimensionality sets in. And we, of course, can't store this function explicitly. Um, and uh, well, as probably people are very familiar with, uh, you can you know, compute the ground state energies. This is, allows you to do many great things, determining quantum chemistry, equilibrium, molecular geometries, running molecular dynamics, first principles, and in uh, condensed matter physics, understanding quantum phase transitions, et cetera. So we start from a variational formulation of the ground state energy as the, uh, well, the minimal possible expected energy over all normalized wave functions. And we're interested in methods that yield guaranteed, for today, that yield guaranteed lower bounds on this ground state energy. And in particular, in methods that will carry a sort of quantum embedding interpretation. Um, OK, so I'm going to talk about two such methods. Uh, second part is a bit more preliminary, but hopefully still contains some interesting ideas that people can, uh, well, hopefully people find stimulating. Um, and the second part is more specific to the setting of fermions. And as you'll see, the embedded problems that arise are security problems. Uh, but first setting looks kind of different from other quantum embedding theories that crop up in the sense that the embedded problems are not really impurity problems or ground state eigenvalue problems at all. Okay, so uh, okay, remember this is the problem we're interested in solving. And uh, we're gonna focus in this part of the talk on, uh, well, you can have in mind either quantum spin systems or systems of interacting fermions and second quantization have a lot of formal similarities. Um, and uh, so specifically, uh, uh, our Hilbert space of wave functions in this quantum spin one half case, these arguments of the wave functions are binary valued. I wrote plus or minus one here, but I think throughout I'll use zero one. So, but it, it doesn't really matter. The point is that these arguments are binary valued. And um, it's worthwhile in this setting to just highlight the connection between the kinds of approaches that will be discussed in this part of the talk and uh, which will uh, in particular be semi-definite programming relaxations of the variational formulation, of the ground state energy. Um, and to connect these to the literature on semi-definite programming liter or relaxations um, of combinatorial optimization problems, which are uh, very similar. So uh, in the setting of quantum spin systems, we'll consider some sort of model problem with M sites, index one through M. Uh, so this set notes the index set. And uh, we'll assume that each of these sites gets a binary variable that could be either zero or one. And uh, so uh, the global state then is a binary string, a string of zeros and ones, one for each site in the model. And the kinds of, um, uh, well, you can think of the ground state eigenvalue problem as a sort of quantum generalization of classical combinatorial optimization problems of the form minimizing a function over uh, all binary strings, um, in particular in the case where this function has the form given here, where A is an adjacency matrix for a graph, then this optimization problem is called the max pet problem, which is famous, the difficult in general, um, and for which semi-definite programming relaxation-based approaches uh, offer some of the best uh, uh, approaches uh, uh, to solving the problem with some kind of uh, guarantee of, uh, of, of the bound on the air. And uh, uh, so you can think of this setting as arising from the quantum setting by considering a, a Hamiltonian operator that's diagonal. And then uh, 
the diagonal of that operator you can think of as a function on, po on possible configurations. Um, and uh, that's, that defines the correspondence. So in the quantum world, we're interested in functions that, we're interested in wave functions that map a, a binary string to a complex number or sometimes a real number. And you can think of these uh, alternatively, if you like, as tensors um, in the sense that is defined by this correspondence where you take, uh, well, this multi-indexed object uh, corresponds to a function uh, which takes in a binary string via this equality. Um, and so in this sense, you can think of uh, wave functions as tensors and the m-fold tensor product space in C. So uh, it's useful to introduce this notion uh, uh, of algebras of operators uh, in order to sort of subsume both the quantum spin cases and the fermionic cases all in one go. And um, uh, so, I mean, there's nothing really to the fancy words. By the algebra of operators on Q, I just mean the space of all possible operators on, on, on our Hilbert space. And in the classical world, this corresponds to diagonal operators, which you can think of as essentially functions. So functions on this, this, the space of possible classical states correspond to the diagonals of operators. Um, and uh, so more generally than functions on the, this binary hypercube, you can get operators. Uh, and uh, for any subset of the sites in the model, you have some subalgebra of local operators, or at least we'll assume you have such a thing. And the meaning of this depends a bit on the context. So the classical analog here that I'm thinking of is functions that depend only on a subset of variables. Um, and for quantum spin systems, the notion of the local operator is just an operator that you get by tensoring with identity uh, on the sites that aren't, that lie outside of whatever subset of sites you've identified. And for fermions, um, we have uh, in second quantization for each site, we'll have an accretion and an annihilation operator, and the local algebra of operators will be all the operators that are generated by those corresponding creation and annihilation operators. So uh, these latter two categories don't actually exactly correspond to each other under the Jordan Wigner transformation, which which turns sometimes local fermionic operators into non-local quantum spin operators. Um, but the important point is that there's a suitable notion in each set. That's all that we need to, uh, to proceed. So uh, we're going to assume that our Hamiltonian has a kind of a pairwise structure, as most physical Hamiltonians of interest do, uh, which is namely that if you take the sites in your model, which are like it here, and you break them up into disjoint clusters, we'll assume that our Hamiltonian can be written in the form of the sum of operators that are local only to a single cluster, uh, H gamma, and then operators that are local in the sense of the last slide to a pair of clusters. So again, in the classical world, you can think of these, this kind of function as being a function that depends only on the subset of variables associated to a single cluster, and this only on the variables associated to a pair of clusters. Um, and so, uh, well, this kind of uh, structure, the Hamiltonian is uh, true, or satisfied for many physical problems, uh, basically all of the ones of interest in quantum chemistry and condensed matter, modulo a suitable discretization, suitable choice of the basis, of, uh, quantum chemistry basis. Uh, so uh, the next kind of gadget we want to introduce is called a state, which is really also, you can think of as a density operator, uh, but it's a little more, well, either perspective is valid. So you can, uh, a state is uh, the name for a, a functional that takes any operator in our, yeah, so it takes any operator and assigns a number to it in a way that basically uh, uh, respects the 
uh, permission conjugates and also sends positive definite operators to non-negative numbers. And finally sends the identity operator to one. So uh, the, uh, any such state can alternatively be viewed as something that you could get by tracing against, tracing that operator. So the, the state applied to an operator, think of it as like a quantum expectation, the value of this operator, and it corresponds to, for some density operator rho, which is a positive de definite operator, trace one, what you get by tracing that operator against rho. And we'll, we'll introduce this notation for the set of states on the global algebra of operate, operators, the, low, uh, the, the one cluster ones and the two cluster ones. And uh, the uh, uh, point of departure uh, for the relaxations we'll consider in this part of the talk is that the ground state energy can be thought of not just as a minimization problem over uh, wave functions, but in fact over states or density operators. So if you minimize over all possible states or density operators, the quantum expectation of the Hamiltonian, you just end up with, as your optimal solution, the density operator, which is the rank one density operator corresponding to the ground state wave function. Uh, uh, but this formulation is more flexible from the point of view of semi-definite programming relaxations. Uh, the reason is that uh, you can take uh, this quantum expectation and you can split it up into terms that correspond, uh, so sort of linearly into terms that correspond uh, to, uh, the, to the terms in our assumed format for the Hamiltonian. So uh, this sum or this uh, omega of H can be split into um, sum over local states, omega gamma, H gamma, et cetera, and, and likewise for the two cluster margins. Uh, so it seems like we, in order to minimize, or in order to uh, solve this minimization problem, which is a minimization problem over very high dimensional operators rho, then perhaps only we have to solve a minimization problem over uh, relatively low, low dimensional operators corresponding to the local states omega gamma and omega gamma delta. But there's a huge catch, and the catch is that uh, there's a constraint that we need to enforce, which is that all of these states are jointly representable. In other words, they could have come by restriction from the same uh, global state. And this is a very non-trivial constraint to enforce, that these are jointly representable, and it's in some sense no easier than the original problem. But by exchanging the difficulty of the original problem, which is a high dimensional optimization space for a difficult uh, set of constraints, we can make progress by enforcing only a subset of these constraints uh, and getting a relaxation of the original problem and in turn a lower bound. Uh, so uh, again, joint representability means that all of these uh, local states could have come from the same one by restriction. And we've changed the exponential size of the optimization space for exponential complexity constraint. So our aim is then to, as I said, relax these joint representability constraints to get a lower bound on the ground state energy. And uh, we'll enforce the following three categories of constraints. Uh, so the first is that these, for example, two cluster states really are states in the sense that they correspond to a density operator for, the, uh, for that um, subset of the sites corresponding to the gamma and the delta cluster. So this will correspond to a semi-definite matrix constraint for that density operator for that pair of clusters. The next set of constraints would be called the local consistency constraints, which um, uh, uh, guarantee that uh, our uh, two cluster states are uh, compatible in the sense that if you were to restrict further to single clusters, they would all agree. And uh, you can obtain this. Well, yeah, so this is just uh, 
uh, again, it's just the constraint that you obtain by making sure that all of the two cluster marginals agree on their one clusters, or two cluster states agree on their uh, subsets of single clusters. And then the last kind of constraint that we'll enforce, and this is really the new one to this work that I'm describing, uh, which I should mention. So this first, so this first part of the talk will cover some work that's going with Lin Lin, and then later also with Yu Hao Fu. Uh, so in work with Lin, we introduce this new kind of constraint we call the global consistency constraint, which comes from the uh, fact that if you were to take a bunch of local operators, a gamma, from uh, corresponding that are local to each of the single clusters indexed by gamma, and you take a sum of them and dagger it, multiply it by itself, you get something that's a non-negative uh, definite operator. So when you evaluate the state on it, you should get something that's non-negative. And if you basically expand out this whole left-hand side, you get an inequality constraint, linear inequality constraint that's defined in terms of um, the single um, cluster and pair cluster states, omega gamma and omega gamma delta. And uh, okay, that's a linear inequality constraint that holds for any possible choice of operators. And if you really unpack what it means uh, to hold for all possible choices of operators, local operators, a gamma, it turns out to correspond to a global semi-definite constraint that couples, uh, directly couples all of the possible uh, two cluster states, omega gamma delta. So concretely, now I'm gonna exchange uh, the cluster indices for i and j, which previously I used for the site indices, but it won't really make a difference going forward. So concretely, we obtain the following uh, optimization problem uh, when we carry out, or when we enforce only those three kinds of constraints from the last slide. So we minimize some expected energy over density operators rho i and rho ij that correspond to single and pair clusters, subject to this constraint of non-negativity uh, on the uh, uh, pair cluster density operator. Uh, a linear constraint that relates uh, pair cluster density operators with single cluster uh, corresponding to the local consistency constraints. This differs depending on whether the setting is uh, 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 well, the meaning of these density operators differs depending on whether the setting is uh, fermionic or quantum spin, but formally these uh, are exactly the same format. And, and uh, the trace of these have to be one. Uh, to uh, satisfy the overall normalization condition. And finally, I've written abstractly this global consistency constraint, sorry, global semi-definite, global semi-definite constraint, which uh, is saying that some matrix defined linearly in terms of the row I and row IJ is positive semi-definite. And uh, these matrices HI and HIJ have to, are defined in terms of the, uh, the Hamiltonian that, that was specified. So we'll call this the two marginal relaxation because these local states are analogs of marginals in classical probability. So this is analogous to, uh, well, yeah, these rho i and rho ij, you can think of them as being analogous to uh, 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 marginal distributions of a probability uh, distribution in the classical world. Uh, so by analogy, we'll call this the two marginal relaxation. And uh, well, it's optimal value, whatever it is, it's a lower bound on the true value and we hope that it's tight. And it can become more tight as we do. Uh, so we can either add kind of more constraints or we can expand the size of these clusters. And we should be able to see kind of systematic improvability in either direction. Um, uh, but here we'll only consider going up to the two marginal level and then consider kind of expanding the size of the cluster. So uh, this is a semi-definite program, which is a convex optimization problem, but the difficulty is that it's very hard still to solve computationally. So if you were to plug it into kind of a black box solver, um, the scaling may not reflect kind of the true scaling uh, or the, basically the ideal scaling for solving this problem. And uh, uh, so in this second work with Yuha, we've introduced uh, an approach for solving this problem, which 
can call using partial duality. And um, what this means is that we are going to dualize uh, only the global semi-definite constraint. Uh, so when you do this, you write down the Lagrangian uh, minimax problem by, by introducing a dual, a dual matrix variable for the global semi-definite constraint. You get an op, a maximization problem over dual positive definite matrix variables x of this kind of functional of x, which is itself defined as the optimal value of some quote unquote effective problem, which looks very much like the problem that I just wrote down, except that uh, the global semi-definite constraint has been removed and the Hamiltonian has been replaced with an effective Hamiltonian that depends on the value of the dual variable. Um, so this is a similar in structure, but the global semi-definite constraint is omitted and it's been exchanged for an effective contribution dependent on X. <clears throat> and we'll say more about this in the paper, but uh, this can be viewed as giving a problem interpretation of a quantum embedding theory. So when you introduce these dual variables, you get these effective Hamiltonians for local pieces of the problem. And computationally, we'll see that the difficult problem parts of the problem can be parallelized across the pairs of clusters. So, uh, uh, so by uh, kind of as an outer loop optimizing uh, this uh, dual variable, Within the inner loop, you'll have uh, optimization steps that can be decoupled across the different local embedded problems. Um, and these are kind of iterated to self consistency uh, in an optimization sense of solving this, uh, this minimax problem. So, I have a quick question. Yeah. Uh, there is a question. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, you have this hi of x and hij of x. Did you have like explicit formulas for them from the doing the duality thing? Yeah. Okay. So they depend linearly on X. Okay. Thanks. Sure. So uh, then the basic approach is that we want to perform ideally projected gradient ascent on this functional F of X over the positive semi uh, uh which we could do by alternating between the following two steps. So first obtaining, solving these effective problems, holding X fixed, and then updating X in the gradient ascent step direction, uh, that is the direction of the primal variable, and then projecting onto this cone. <coughs> uh, so in practice, one is itself difficult to solve. So we'll replace the step one with a single iteration of an augmented Lagrangian type solver that we'll commit the details of. And after exploiting translation and variance, um, you can get a per, per iteration cost that scales linearly in the number of clusters. This uh, bottleneck is basically running K full matrix diagonalizations on, on the order of uh, the size of the largest density operator that you have to deal with. Uh, so, but these steps are kind of all decoupled and can be run perfectly in parallel. And uh, without translation invariance, the global semi-definite constraint grows cubically in complexity k. You think of this as being kind of fair because it forced uh, in the fermion land in particular, it introduces, or it, it enforces um, exactness for non-interactive problems. So solving a general kind of non-interactive fermionic problem is kind of cubic scaling operation uh, without further information. <clears throat> and uh, now the scaling in the cluster size though is exponential because these local density operators grow as the clusters grow. So in our experiments, we go only up to cluster size four, um, but in ongoing work, I'll only hint at with you how, who is in the audience, and Fabian uh, who's also in the audience, Berkeley, uh, uh, we're looking at potential further relaxation within the clusters for uh, ab initio quantum chemistry problems. So I'll just present results for these two model uh, problems which are quantum spin systems, transverse field icing model, anti ferromagnetic Heisenberg model. Um, and uh, okay, so first you can look at an exact benchmark. So you just look at a problem that's small enough to solve by brute force and um, compare the relaxation energy 
against the true energy and see check that it's going down. Uh, so this H is the transverse field strength of the BFI model. And uh, these numbers correspond to the relaxation error uh, for a 20 by one lattice and a four by four lattice. So you can see it's going down as the clusters become larger. For the anti-ferromagnetic Heisenberg model, uh, there isn't a tunable parameter, but you can see the relaxation error is going down as the uh, clusters are becoming larger. And um, it's worth pointing out the effect of these global consistency constraints. So if you omit these constraints, the energy blows up uh, rather, uh, well, rather badly. So the global, the, the global uh, consistency constraints are doing something non-trivial. Um, and then finally, it's worthwhile to sort of check the performance. So uh, we want to make sure that uh, the convergence isn't depending in kind of bad way on the system size. So here we look at um, uh, the, the graph of the convergence as a function of the iteration count. Uh, so for several different values of the H and the TFI model, these are different system sizes, and different lines. Um, and uh, okay, in, with this kind of augmented Lagrangian approach, you often see these sort of wacky look convergence plots. Usually if you tune, specifically to the problem, which wasn't done here. You can kind of tame them a bit. But the important thing is really you get several, many digits of accuracy uh, quickly, and, which is typical of augmented Lagrangian approaches. And there isn't any sort of obvious dependence of the convergence um, on the system size. Uh, and likewise, you can check whether the convergence depends obviously on the cluster size, and we see that it does. So kind of to conclude this part of the talk, the outlook is that um, for these kind of quantum marginal relaxations, so there are other semi-definite relaxations, especially the two RDM theories that have been introduced in quantum chemistry, but scalable optimization approaches for these, this kind of relaxation hasn't really been explored before. Um, so uh, if you only limit yourself to black box solvers, you'll be limited by sort of unphysical scaling not aware of the embedding structure of the optimization problem. Uh, and uh, okay, well, with this optimization framework in place, there's kind of two then um, options for trying to get around the exponential scaling of the size and the size of the embedded problems. Uh, the first is, like I mentioned before, to pursue further local relaxation within the clusters. And second is to use a kind of more sophisticated method for solving these embedded problems, uh, perhaps, for example, tensor networks, um, in order to parameterize the, den the local density operators directly. Um, I also just want to highlight some related work where we've used analogous classical relaxations to solve uh, continuous global optimization problems, many spurious local minima. This is also going with Yu Hao, the student Yang Chen. And uh, I'll just also throw up some references to related work. So here's some classical work on combinatorial optimization, rising graphical models, um, two RDM theories. There are many papers in the groups of Maziotti and Kata. Um, <clears throat> uh, there are other quantum marginal type relaxations that don't use this kind of uh, global consistency constraint. And finally, here's some sort of anal classical analogs that we've introduced to the quantum relaxations in this talk for the purpose of solving quantum or multi-marginal optimal transfer problems and uh, global optimization problems, like I just mentioned. Okay, so that's it for the first part of the talk. And then the second part uh, is a bit more brief. So in this part, uh, I'm gonna consider only fermionic models, the sites indexed by I, and uh, these could be in orbitals and uh, partition, and suppose we're given some partition of the sites into clusters, we call C alpha, the subsets. Uh, so these will be disjoint for simplicity. And we're going to consider Hamiltonians of the form <coughs> the following form. So you have a general non interacting term, and you have a term that uh, is a sum of operators that are local to a single cluster. So in particular, this contained. You know, this covers the Hubbard model. Um, 
uh, if your clusters you know, are at least the size of a single uh, spinful site. And um, for, well, it's useful to consider again, the density operator formulation of the ground state problem. So minimizing uh, trace of the energy operator, Hamiltonian operator against the density operator is subject to these constraints on the density operator. Again, the optimal solution is the unique ground state uh, or corresponds to the unique ground state of uh, this equation. <coughs> uh, you can also throw in, of course, a particle number constraint. Uh, I'm just going to leave that out for simplicity. And uh, so the way this relaxation works is uh, quite different. And it doesn't, uh, as far as I know, correspond to any relaxation that I've seen even in the classical literature. Um, and it also in particular is, looks quite different from two RDM. Uh, so uh, what we're gonna do is introduce optimization variables D or, an op or a matrix optimization variable D for the one RDM. So uh, yeah, the one RDM find here. And uh, we're gonna also introduce copies of the global density operator, one for each cluster. So this rho alpha is a copy of rho, but it's global. So it's not local to the alpha cluster. It's still a global density operator. Uh, so in, in, it's still intractable to deal with computation. But nonetheless, uh, although it's intractable, we still have this equivalent formulation of the problem. So the first, the non-interacting energy is given here, the trace of the matrix hopping matrix H against the one RDM. And uh, the second uh, term you can write as a trace of each of these local operators H alpha against its personal uh, uh, density operator rho alpha. Again, is global object, but they're all constrained to be equal via this constraint. So we haven't changed anything. These are all constrained to be density operators. And the one RDM is constrained to correspond to each of the uh, these density operators via the appropriate constraint. So, but though this is intractable, we can relax it in a sort of uh, unusual way where we're going to then still keep these row alphas as global objects, but we're going to constrain them to only agree up to their one RDM. So, in other words, we just omit this constraint and we leave this constraint, which says that they'll only agree up to the one RDM. So we're left with this, which is a relaxation. It's gonna give us a lower bound, whatever it is. Although it still seems intractable, right? Because we have these global density operators, which are uh, uh, not something we can store. Uh, so we have to get around this somehow. But we'll see that kind of miracle occurs. So one way to see this is to introduce dual variables for each of the one RDM constraints. So for each of these matrix constraints, we're gonna have a matrix dual variable, uh, our emission matrix lambda alpha. And the dual optimization problem that you get has the form of maximizing over these dual variables, subject to the constraint that they kind of, when you add them up, uh, aggregate to uh, building up the entire hopping matrix. This sum of energies uh, where, uh, this energy E alpha of lambda is defined to be the ground state energy of an impurity problem whose Hamiltonian is given by um, non-interacting part uh, given by matrix lambda and interacting part given by uh, the local operator H alpha. So these impurity problems are still of global size, but their uh, impurity size is uh, only of the size of however large your clusters were um, in the partition uh, into, into clusters C alpha. So we've reduced the kind of the difficulty of evaluating this, uh, this op objective to solving a bunch of impurity problems, which is a lot better than what we start with, because impurity problems are better in some sense than completely general um, many body problems. So uh, still though, you have to worry about how to solve it. And uh, well, you don't just even want to compute the objective. You would have to, for example, compute its gradient, which is furnished via Hellman-Fine theorem as the one RDM of its corresponding 
these, these impurity problems. So we don't just need to find their energies, we need to find their one RDMs. And you could imagine that in principle, to determine the one RDM, you could recover it from the, the Green's function for the impurity problem, just from the imaginary axis values. So, uh, so okay, well, I, maybe this equation will make sense to people to whom it does and otherwise ignore it. But uh, yeah, basically it would be sufficient to compute the Green's, the Green's function for the impurity problem on the imaginary axis. So you could in principle use continuous time auxiliary field Monte Carlo approaches that are commonly used to solve um, purity problems and then recover everything you need in order to do this optimization. But we kind of uh, want to avoid this because that's, well, let's, it may be a good idea, but let's just uh, explore further. We'll see that there's a way to avoid this at the price of further relaxation, but allows us something more direct. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the approach is that, um, uh, well, first I'll define a little bit of extra notation. So uh, if you let D of rho define the map that takes a, a density operator to its one RDM, and if you let D alpha denote the corresponding diagonal block corresponding to the fragment, um, and then suppose moreover that for each fragment we have a so set of so-called bath orbitals. So in other words, a matrix that's the size m by r, where m is the number of sites, and r is going to be some number of bath orbitals. And these columns of this matrix are going to be orthonormal. We can consider some further relaxation, which is that these density, so these rho alphas don't have to just agree up to their, their so we're not going to enforce that. The, they agree fully up to their one RDM, but they're going to agree in a sort of restricted sense. So in particular, uh, we're going to have some extra variable D that agrees with them on, uh, on the block diagonal, and which also agrees with them um, on these, uh, uh, after sort of, <coughs> uh, uh, on the bath space, basically. So applying B alpha star on B alpha on either side that this uh, one RDM variable D that we're optimizing over corresponds to these, uh, these impurity density operators were alpha up to the bath space. And uh, you can imagine these V alphas as being uh, fixed and then this still defines a convex optimization problem in principle could be solved. But um, there's an idea which is that since any choice of bath orbitals yields a lower bound, you're actually free to pick the best V alpha that maximize this lower bound. And in this sense, you can actually think of these V alphas as a dual variable. And uh, 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 what you see is that the dual problem that we wrote before, uh, or the dual problem to the problem I just wrote down, simplifies after optimizing over the path orbitals to something that looks very similar to what we had before, but where uh, um, you have an extra constraint, which is that these lambda alphas have to be each consist of a local component and a low rank component. And so if you have a lambda of this form that consists of a local component and a low rank component, then there exists a canonical transformation which transforms the problem. Um, well, it will basically decouple the problem into some kind of non-interacting virtual space and some uh, effective active space where you have uh, a number of orbitals consisting of the size of the cluster plus however many bath orbitals you have. So <clears throat> instead of solving the impurity problem of global size, you can actually just solve one that's of size at, at the penalty of some extra relaxation that's of size equal to the fragment plus the bath. And for certain systems, this may be small enough even to solve by exact diagonalization. So I just will provide a very preliminary experiment, uh, which offers a, a comparison to the very natural point of comparison, which is density matrix embedding theory. Uh, so if you choose the number of bath orbitals to be the number of sites in the cluster, then you get embedded impurity problems that are the same, same size as the problems, impurity problems that arise in DMET. So if you compare both these methods on a 1D hover model with eight sites, which is very small, but small enough to exactly diagonalize um, and use clusters of size two. Uh, 
then we can compare the energy uh, that you obtain. So here's Hartree Fock for reference. Here's the exact energy, the DMET energies and the variational impurity bath and embedding energies. And on the right uh, is a comparison of the recovered one RDM, both of the methods. So the accuracy for the same kind of amount of work in terms of the size of the impurity problem you have to solve is similar, although the accuracy comparison varies over the uh, oh, the, the, the x-axis here is U in the Hubbard model, I should say, on both plots. So it varies across the axis, but in fact, it's typically better. The one RDM is typically better in the impurity bath of better. So the sort of outlook for this part of the talk is that, with the caveat that these are preliminary results, uh, uh, it's interesting that, I think it's quite interesting that you can get impurity problems out of something that still offers a guaranteed lower bound. And um, the optimization formulation sort of guarantees the existence of a solution to the theory. So there's no dependence directly on a kind of gapless mean field theory, as there is in DMET. It'd be interesting to explore the comparison settings where that poses problems. There's also the possibility of uh, further constraining this relaxation. Uh, and uh, I think it would be very interesting to continue to look at the relationship between the baths here and those that arise in TMET and also the impurity problems in EMF. So, um, yeah, thanks very much for your attention. Here are the references for the talk. Work with Lynn, Yihao, and then this ongoing work. This is the last part of the talk. Thanks.